Hello everyone. So today we're going to get into the home fronts, if you will, of World War One. We're going to be talking about things that were going on in different countries, and we're going to go over a couple different videos, and, and just to get to what was life like and kind of the purpose of a lot of things um, throughout the war. Now in general, before I go into this, if you were not in a war zone, this is a little bit different than World War II because you don't have like the bombers and stuff. Um, if you were on England and stuff like that, like you would try to do as much as you possibly could regularly, if you will. But you need to understand that the, the idea of war and what was going on, it was always present in your kind of thoughts, if you will. So what we have in World War One is what we call a total war. And the basic idea of total war is that everything in the nation is going to the war effort, that there's nothing else that matters. And in the end, kind of war, if you will, trumps personal preferences, what you do day to day, and some people even like your job. Um, political parties kind of take a back seat for the most part. Like there were things that different groups wanted to do, but it wasn't as divided as it would normally be under party politics. Um, and, and one of the reasons for this is that early on the war was believed that this would be over by Christmas, you know, we're, we're starting in August and by Christmas it'll be all said and done. But as it starts to drag on, there becomes massive need for munitions and soldiers. And, and so it reshapes everything that's going on in these countries in order to win this just terrible war. And part of that was increased government control of a variety of different areas, okay? And number one was conscription, okay? The need for men never seemed to end. I mean, pre-war, all of these armies were pretty big, but uh, like an example, Britain actually in 1914 had the largest volunteer army in the world, had over one million men, but by 1916, they have to draft people. Okay, and and basically there was a bit of a lottery system depending on the country, but because there was such a need for skilled labor to build like tanks and guns and all that type of stuff, there were certain men that they didn't want to go work um, because they needed them in factories and they needed them to run certain things. Okay, so a lot of skilled workers would be exempted. And you could see men fighting anywhere really from the ages of 16 all the way up to even 60 by the end of the war because the, the need in these battles were so huge. And here's just a little idea of like what was going on in Britain at the time. By the turn of the 20th century, the era of mass armies and industrial war had dawned. When the British Army's deployment to South Africa in the Boer War revealed a worrying lack of young men fit enough to join the army, the National Service League and some politicians lobbied for the introduction of compulsory military training. The League's leadership included well-known soldiers, celebrities like Lord Roberts and Robert Baden-Powell. The creation of the Boy Scouts was for them the second best option helping create a pool of militarized youth. When the First World War began in 1914, the long-standing establishment reluctance to introduce conscription was still powerful, but by the end of 1914, the rush of volunteers had slowed, and in 1915, the government turned to moral coercion, launching recruitment drives, and then the Derby scheme. It wasn't enough. In January 1916, the first bill to introduce conscription received royal assent. It was an almost unprecedented extension of state power. British men from 18 to 41 were legally deemed to have been duly enlisted for the duration of the war. Continental Europe mass armies were all built on this type of conscription, but it felt very alien to the British. Age, occupation, ill health and conscientious objection could all exempt a man from service. But every man was legally born a soldier, waiting for his call-up papers. Some marched in protest, and hundreds of thousands of applications and appeals for exemptions were approved or rejected by endless tribunals. In Ireland, the prospect of conscription led to the real threat of armed rebellion, 
In those countries of the empire that gave their electorates a choice, some voted for, some against. Even so, many thought it was time the slackers did their bit. And by the end of 1916, more than a million men had been called up and went, whether they wanted to go or not. And that just gives you an idea like of a nation that was actually prepared for war. You can't even imagine how um, a nation that was maybe ill-prepared, how many more soldiers that they would actually have to bring in. Okay, so now what we're also going to have to do with economies is make some changes as well. And so this idea of control is going to come in here. Um, the free market is going to be put on pause, okay? We're going to have things like price, wage, and rent controls because a lot of people's wages, they, they, the, the government is going to need just more money for the war, okay? Um, food rationing is also going to be a big deal. And a lot of people always talk about this stuff for World War II. And this stuff absolutely happened in World War II. It was very organized. But World War I was really where these ideas are developed, okay? And you're also going to get the nationalization of uh, the transportation system and major injuries. Um, and not injuries, sorry, industries. Everything has to be geared toward war. Um, citizens at home were encouraged to work really hard because their efforts were just as important to win the war. And this was a big thing and a big part of this idea of total war. And to give you a quote on the right there, there's President Woodrow Wilson who said, he who remains to till the soil and man the factories are no less a part of the army than the men beneath the battle flags. And that gives you an idea of, of how important all of this was and the changes that had to be made. Now, we'll give some examples of, of some nations and what they did. So, for instance, in Germany, a man by the name of Walter, Walter Rathenow was put in charge of the War Materials Board. And it was his job to allocate like strategic raw materials to where they were needed. And this was really successful because in the earlier part of the war, I mean, Germany was able to have their tanks and, and you know plenty of weapons and their machine guns and all those bullets. Um... And so for actual war materials, they were in good shape. However, there were other issues for them, and the food rationing is where this kind of falls apart. The British had a massive blockade in the North Sea. They also controlled the Mediterranean. You've got Russia on the other side, and food was an issue. That picture on the bottom there were our German peasant women sifting through garbage trying to find food. And we believe by the end of the war, 750,000 German civilians would die of hunger because the average food ration got below 1,000 calories per day, and many people just can't live on that. In the end, the military actually does take over everything. Um, the top guy is General Paul von Hindenburg, who would actually serve as uh, a future president in Germany after the war. And then you have Eric Ludendorff, who is his kind of right-hand man there. And they are just going to, to take over everything and do everything they can to win the war. And we'll come back and try to recover when it's all said and done. Um, an example of a law they put into pl place is the Auxiliary Service Law in December of 1916, which said all male non-combatants between the ages of 17 and 60 must only work in a job crucial to the war effort. So there was no like entrepreneurship. You weren't doing your own thing. If you were an able-bodied male that wasn't fighting for some reason, you were going to do a job that was going to help them win the war. Um, initially Britain, so now, so what goes on with Britain? Initially Britain tries to avoid this control and they try to keep the free market going, but they realize that that needs to change and they're going to create the Ministry of Mun Munitions and the guy that's going to run that show is David Lloyd George, who will become a prime minister in the future and fairly important to the Treaty of Versailles, even though that was a complete and utter catastrophe. He had a variety of powers as uh, the Ministry of Munitions. Um, private industry would be changed over to create specific war materials. He actually had a staff of 65,000 bureaucrats to make sure that everything was properly enforced. And eventually he was given the power to take over plants if they didn't cooperate with specific directives. So everything in the economy here was geared toward war. And David Lloyd George basically had the power to do whatever he saw fit. 
France struggled a little bit differently. Um, they lost 75% of their coal due to lands the Germans had occupied. And again, because, you know, heat and all that other stuff is run off of coal, this was just devastating. And in France, you had an interesting power struggle in both economics and basically societal deals on who should actually be in charge, the military guys, which you saw clearly in Germany, or should it actually be the civilian government that runs everything? And by 1917, a new leader in France has elected George Clemenceau, and he actually will establish civilian control and reorganize the government to be more efficient but in the end, the generals aren't running everything. In France, it's actually the civilian leaders. So you had different ways the government was you know, taking control in different areas uh, of Europe at the time. Now, other nations at home with this type of stuff were struggling. Um, Russia and Austria-Hungary had really weak economies to begin with. And a lot of cases, they really struggled with producing what was needed for the war. For instance, Russia could really only arm about a quarter or a half of their men with modern weapons. And so what ended up happening is some of these men actually went into battles with swords, like swords. The Germans have, you know, machine guns and the Russians are coming in with swords. Yet another reason why this war was so senseless and and Austria-Hungary was really in the same boat, and, and these weak economies and, and the massive loss of life, particularly in Russia, are going to cause some problems after the war. And you actually can kind of see the stem of the Bolshevik, Bolshevik revolutions, which I'll be talking about in a future video. They really have their bases here because of how ill-equipped the government was to provide for their people. Now as I skipped ahead a little bit. And, and so that's what we need to understand. The whole idea here is the, the purpose of this, this video is understanding the importance of how these nations that were more successful, like the Britain and France and Germany lasting to the end of the war versus nations that weren't as successful, say Russia and Austria, Hungary, because of the organizations of their economies, because of the organizations of their government, to do what needed to be done to win the war, but at the same time, try to still keep production and stuff like that going. And it was really fascinating to kind of see there. All right, guys, so uh, make sure you review this, take some notes, and I will see you soon.